गुड मॉर्निंग एवरीबडी टूडे टॉपिक इज एन इंटरेस्टिंग टॉपिक इनफैक्ट यूरनरी कैलकुलई स्टोन्स इन दूरनरी ट्रैक्ट इज वन ऑफ द ओल्डेस्ट डिजीजेस टू द ह्यूमन बींग्स देर इज एविडेंस इवन एंशियंट ह्यूमन बींग्स सफर्ड फ्रॉम कैलकुल इन दूरनरी ट्रैक्ट today we'll know how these uh, stones form what is the mechanism and what are the causes of uh, development of urinary calculi what symptoms do they cause and uh, what are the ways of uh, investigation and how to manage them all these things first let us know how these uh, salts form i mean uh, stones form in the urinary tract there are a few theories uh, which is most possible causes i mean the pathogenesis of uh, uh, formation of stones in the urinary tract super saturation of urine with stone forming substances super saturation of urine with stone forming substances uh, causes probably the solutes uh, which can form stones to crystallize and form stones probably this is a most possible reason why the stones form but that may not be may not be the only cause there are the mechanisms they need a needles on which to form there is something called randolph's plaques as per this randolph plaque theory uh calcium phosphate precipitates in the thin loop of henle as you know the nephron has loop of henle in the thin loop of henle calcium phosph phosphate which is a normal constituent of urine sometimes gets precipitated on the basement membrane of thin loop of henle and this gets eroded and uh, reaches the interstitium surrounding this endless loop from there it traverses to the subepithelial region of the papilla last week i told you there is a renal papillae from which the calyces start so when uh, this calcium phosphate which is precipitated reaches the subepithelial portion of the renal papillae sometimes it gets eroded and that forms a nidus on which calcium oxalate or phosphate uh, these things uh, can deposited the ions of which can be deposited if the urine is having super saturation of these substances uh, at that point so probably both these mechanisms work in most of the uh, pathogenesis of uh, stones in the urinary tract let me tell you most of the stones are formed in the pelvis of the kidney and later on travel to different parts of the urinary tract like ureter and bladder so the calculi in the ureter and sometimes in the bladder and the ureter are secondary to the primary stone Uh, which was uh, developed in the pelvis of the ureter yeah primary bladder calculi also can develop they have a different uh, pathogenesis we will be taking up that while dealing with the bladder uh, bladder conditions so altered urinary solutes and colloids probably the reason why the stones form in the urinary tract these colloids which are normally present and some mucoproteins keep these tend to keep these solutes which are likely to get precipitated 
when they are super saturated. So reduced collides also can cause uh, the I mean, formation of urinary stones. There are some dietic, dietetic reasons why stone formation is favored in the urinary tract. Probably high protein diet and high salt diet favors the formation of stone formation in the urinary tract. Contrary to the popular assumptions, high calcium diet may not favor the formation of uh, uh, calcium stones in the urinary tract. Yes, there may be abnormalities of absorption. Even the normal calcium can be absorbed, enhanced absorption can be there from the gut in some people. That may be the reason, but not the dietary calcium. Uh, in fact, dietary calcium has got inverse relationship with the absorption. So that means more calcium you take, the less it gets absorbed from the gut. Another dietetic factor that can influence formation of uh, urinary stones is uh, vitamin A deficiency. Vitamin A is required for the epithelial integration, I mean integrity. The urethelium, <coughs> the urethelial integrity is compromised and there is a, uh, because of absence of uh, vitamin A, a deficiency of vitamin A, then that can form an edus on which these supersaturated substances of the urine can get deposited gradually and the stone can generate from there. Venal infection is another important reason for development of certain types of stones. You see, there are different different stones. We will be dealing with that in the next uh, slide. So, renal infection causes calcium phosphate stones, calcium triple phosphate stones, we call them. I will be talking about that in detail a little later. So, phosphate stone formation has got uh, etiology as renal infection. What happens is uh, If the urine is infected with urea splitting organisms like uh, Proteus, Pseudomonas, Klebsiella and certain staph and Staphylococci which can uh, generate urease enzyme. If they are producing urease enzyme, they split the urea into ammonia. Ammonia is highly alkaline as you know and in alkaline urine this phosphate gets precipitated and then tend to form phosphate stones. That's another mechanism by which uh, the urinary sta stones form. Stasis of the urine also promote formation of stone. Decreased urinary citrate and decreased urinary magnesium or found to be causative factors in formation of stones in many cases. So urinary citrate, normally urine citrate is, uh, is there in uh, normal urine and also magnesium to some extent. If the levels decrease, they promote formation of stones. Prolonged immobilization also causes hypercalcemia and hypercalcuria. See, in immobilization, osteoclastic activity of the bone increases and then bone calcium is mobilized into the blood and later to the to the urine it is excreted. So prolonged immobilization due to any reason either due to disease or a sickness or uh, sometimes an accident or whatever can cause hypercalcuria and that can lead to precipitation of these calcium stones, so stone forming substances in the urine because they are super saturated. Hyperparathyroidism likewise, 
can be a very rare cause of uh, uh, recurrent urinary stones. You know, parathormon, again, mobilizes calcium from the bones into the blood. So hypercalcuria occurs and hypercal uh, hypercalcemia occurs and of course it is calcium is excreted to the kidneys as hypercalcuria. So hyperparathyroidism can be a reason uh, an etiology for stone formation in certain individuals. So in case of uh, recurrent stone formation uh, you may have to rule out this cause. Certain genetic factors also will be responsible for formation of uh, different kinds of stones. When the urinary substances, certain urinary substances which can potentially form stones, uh, their handling in the ducts, uh, tubules of the urinary tubules uh, is defective because of some genetic factors then also there is likelihood of these substances getting concentrated in the urine and forming stones. So in general these are all the reasons and the mechanisms by which some people uh, do have uh, development of uh, urinary stones. What are all the various types of uh, renal calculi we see? Most of them uh, you can say 90% of the stones contain calcium, either calcium oxalate or calcium phosphate uh, along with some other substances. So calcium containing stones predominate in most of the patients and the remaining uh, small percentage, the bulk of which will have uric acid stones uric acid stones uh, again uh, I'll tell you uh, there are reasons for forming uric acid stones when we are dealing with uric acid stones and cysteine calculus a very very minute number of people will have inborn errors of metabolism which uh, where the cysteine cystinuria will be there the cystinuria and the cysteine tends to crystallize in the urine and form cysteine calculus. So these are all the types of uh, renal stones in general we see and the, what I want to stress is the most of the stones are calcium containing stones whether calcium oxalate or containing phosphate. Let us see these stones and their morphological characteristics and uh, radiological uh, characteristics. So among the calcium stones, calcium oxalate forms the most, I mean commonest stone. So if you take the population, most of the time what we see is a calcium oxalate stone. It is hard, relatively hard. Uh, it has got irregular short projections on the surface. The crystal structure is in such a way that there are sharp projections. It is white in color when pure, but mostly what happens in the it damages the urethelium and causes hemorrhage. So urethelium damages and blood gets accumulated. See, this is the altered blood that is uh, uh, coated on the I mean surface of this stone, which is causing the brownish color this alters blood so this is uh, very characteristic of uh, the calcium oxalate stone with sharp projections on the surface it is radio opaque so when you take an x-ray it will appear it is not radiolucent it is radio opaque and as i was telling you it's a commonest stone and the mechanism how it forms is probably the randall's plaque mechanism uh, where uh, the subepithelial region uh, the calcium phosphate which gets precipitated uh, will form an edus on which calcium oxalate ions will gradually form and make a stone 
So another calculus is uh, phosphate calculus. In fact, uh, this phosphate calculus uh, we call it strovite uh, stone. Uh, it contains magnesium and ammonium phosphate along with the calcium. So it is triple phosphate, calcium phosphate, magnesium phosphate and ammonium phosphate together they form this stone. It is uh, dirty white in color, it is soft, powder like just you can take it into hand, you can uh, squeeze it, it, powder comes out of it sometimes. It grows silently and fast. Usually this is caused by, as I was telling you earlier, infections with urea splitting organisms. So urea is produced by these organisms will uh, convert urea uh, and I mean uh, split urea and liberate ammonia which is highly alkaline and in the alkaline urine calcium with this phosphate gets uh, precipitated and then forms stone it fills the area where it is there usually it is in the pelvis see the pelvis uh, almost it uh, becomes a cast of the pelvis because silently grows and fills up all the calcium these are the calcial cast minor major calcial cast so it looks like a staghorn so we call it staghorn calculus typical of phosphate calculus well phosphate calculus also can form in the bladder which we will deal with that a little later when we are dealing with the bladder so staghorn calculus is strovite stone and it is it develops in the alkaline urine uric acid stones are due to excess production of uric acid this occurs uh, in hyperuricemia occurs due to gout uh, a few percent of people with gout have uricemia and they have uh, formation of these stones or dietary yes high purine diet uh, people taking uh, uh, red meats uh, and food like that will have uh, high hyperuricemia and then uh, the uric acid is of course the uh, excreted by the kidneys into the urine and urine where they are supersaturated this uric acid decrystallize and form stones they are hard stones again like calcium oxalate and multifaceted and usually multiple and they develop in acidic urine in contrast to phosphate calculus they constitute about 6% of the stones which we see and they are radiolucent see these are the one of the uh, stones which does not appear when you take an x-ray they may be stone and uh, they don't cause any radio uh, opaque shadow they are radiolucent but what happens sometimes uh, they are not pure uric acid there may be some uh, calcium in them so in such cases there may be a faint shadow otherwise pure uric acid stones in the uh, urinary tract or radiolucent Cystine calculus is a very interesting calculus in the sense that it is because of uh, inborn error of metabolism. Due to an inborn error of metabolism, renal tubular handling of uh, cystine, ornithine, lysine, and arginine, all these four substances are excreted into the urine in large amounts because of the due to an inborn error of, error of metabolism and cysteine is the one among the these four which I told you which gets precipitated and then they form multiple stones and they are very very hard harder than 
the other stones which I, I already told you calcium oxalate and uh, uh, uric acid stones is harder difficult to break uh, with extra corporeal lithotripsy also so I'll be telling you about that a little later so they are radi radio opaque fortunately they can be seen in the uh, x-rays and they are very very rare even though they are rare, if once you have this inborn er error of metabolism, they frequently form these stones and the patient becomes very frequent. I mean, frequently he has to take uh, help of the healthcare provider to get rid of these stones. Probably a surgery every year or intervention every year. Because they form, they continue to form throughout his life. But they are very, very rare otherwise. So this is about the cystine calculus. There are other minor very uh, 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 rare uh, stone, even cysteine stone is rare. You have xanthine stones, you have some drugs which gets precipitated and become stones in the urinary tract. Uh, but they constitute a small, very, very minute amount of uh, popular population. So, what are the clinical features by which they present? And most stones occur in young people between 30 to 50 years. And uh, males slightly have incidence more than the female patients. How do they present? They can present silently, that means they don't have any symptoms, and you have investigated them. Probably somebody has got. Uh, abdominal scan with ultrasound and they found stones in the urinary tract. Sometimes an x-ray is taken for some other reason, x-ray abdomen, it showed radio opaque shadow which is found, I mean, confirmed to be a stone. Like that, silently also they can present. But most of the people with stone present with pain. The characteristics of this pain and all we have to know in detail. I'll be telling you in the next slide. So pain is one of the presenting symptom of these stones. Hematuria, yes, blood in the urine can be caused by the stones sometimes. Uh, frank blood can come and uh, that can be the presenting symptom of a patient and an investigation showed there can be there are stones in the urinary tract. So hematuria can be a present presenting feature but otherwise most of the time you have only microscopic hematuria very rarely it presents as passing frank blood in the urine urinary infection can be another way of presenting the stone can present as urinary infection so he has symptoms of urinary uh, infection urinary tract and then while investigating you found that there is which is probably uh, aggravating this infection and causing uh, the infection, I mean stone formation. So urinary infection is another way of uh, presentation of this uh, disease. So these are all the ways uh, how it presents. So let's go into the what type of pain it uh, causes. See when a stone which uh, obstructs the urinary tract Pressure increases proximal, proximal to the obstruction. I was telling you this the previous class when we are dealing with hydronephrosis. When the pressure increases, suppose there is a stone which is in the pelvis and gets lodged at the pelvic ureteric junction, uh, which is little uh, narrower than, of course, obviously pelvis. So when it lodges there and obstructs the flow of the urine, pressure develops in, in the pelvis of the kidney that stretches the urethelium. <coughs> Nerves in the ureth I mean, uh, underneath the urethelium are very sensitive and also this back pressure can increase the size of the kidney because of pressure and the capsule of the kidney can be stretched. Again the capsule of the kidney is 
and has richly supplied with uh, pain sensitive nerves. So that can cause a fixed pain in the loin. So whichever side, side this kidney, uh, kidney gets obstructed because of the stone in the pelvic junction, that side there will be severe flank pain. This is a fixed pain and a constant pain. If the stone gets dislodged from there and travels into the ureter and get, gets stuck up in the ureter, then over this fixed pain there is a, again another characteristic of pain develops which is intermittent aggravation. So there is a constant renal fixed pain over which there is exacerbations periodically that is ureteric colic and uh, this characteristic pain will usually be traveling from the loin to groin when the stone goes from pelvic pelvis of the kidney to ureter depending on the exact location of this stone getting lodged the pain can be loin to groin or it can be even be referred to inner aspect of the thigh the scrotum the labia major in female like that the pain all characteristics also will change according to the position of the stone where it is lodged and the stone pain is a very very severe pain probably one of the most excruciating pains uh, anybody can feel is probably a stone pain I mean ureteric colic the patient will be restless breathing and moving in different different positions uh, thinking that it may relieve pain so they are restless and many times uh, this severe pain causes nausea and vomiting they may vomit this pain usually lasts till the treatment is given but it won't last more than 8 hours even if the stone position continues to block usually it will be less than 8 hours it lasts so that is the characteristic of uh, the ureteric colic and uh, renal pain caused by a stone very characteristic so all of you should learn to identify this type of pain because this is very common condition and uh, most of you in your uh, practice when you ultimately finish your graduation will uh, encounter these patients so that's ureteric colic, a severe pain, loin to groin, and it is also associated with dysuria. You, the dysuria will occur especially characteristically uh, when it is irritating the pelvic ureteric junction or ureterovesical junction. There will be a patient passes small quantities of frequent urine. Frequent micturition will have, which is a small in quantities and also they will have hematuria along with it. All these characteristics will give us uh, the diagnosis. At this stage let us also understand some anat anatomical aspects of the urinary tract because stones get lodged at certain points more often than other parts of the urinary tract. So there are natural constrictions in the urinary tract and when stones pass they tend to get lodged there before they pass on to the next part of the urinary tract. One is ureteropelvic junction. Of course ure pelvis is a spacious region and uh, a stone here first gets dislodged lodged at erythropelvic junction. If it passes through this, the next it site of constriction is where in the pelvic brim, in the region of the pelvic brim, 
the urinary is uh, crosses the iliac vessels these are the iliac vessels iliac artery and iliac vein common iliac vessels uh, over the iliac vessels it passes so there will be some uh, angulation and uh, pressure exerted by these vessels on the lumen of the urinary tract and there is a relative constriction there so the stone get tends to get lodged here then the next place where it gets lodged is where it enters the bladder it enters the bladder and the intramural part of the ureter is also narrower so urethrovesical junction is another part where it gets lodged so i was telling you the clinical features there will be loin pain and tenderness if you press in the loin uh, the costo vertebral angle there will be severe tenderness uh, in the ureter colic in the patient with ureter colic uh, ipsilateral costo vertebral angle will be very tender tenderness also can be on deep palpation in the anterior aspect in the right i mean hypochondrium also but not very prominent but costo vertebral angle tenderness is severe patient will be having restless nervous already telling you about this he will have hematuria but definitely micro hem microscopic hematuria if even if frank hematuria is not there if you test his urine blood cells will be there very rarely when uh, it's rather prolonged there can be little hydronephrosis and there can be renal loin swelling also can be there but this is very very low, i mean rare so these are all the clinical features which we elicit for diagnosing the stones in the urinary i mean upper urinary tract how do you investigate urinalysis has to be done first and the first most important is look for blood cells they will indicate that there is a uh, hemorrhage microscopic bleeding caused by the stone most probably uh, oxalate stone which is very very common you can also see in the urinalysis pus cells pyuria can occur even in the absence of uh, infection because it irritates the urothelium and causes pus cells in the urine sometimes frank i mean infection can be there which can cause profuse pus cells uh, in the urine microscopy in recurrent uh, stone formers probably you may have to do a more analysis of the urine like 24 hour urine analysis for certain lithogenic substances like calcium phosphorus and uric acid uh, or sometimes cysteine so you can analyze the 24 for our excretion of these substances in the urine especially if you are suspecting uh, i mean uh, they have a, a causative factor like that so that it, you can treat them blood investigations have to be done bilateral stones or uh, a disease i mean uh, a stone obstructing a uh, solitary functioning kidney can cause uh, raise of uh, serum creatinine and blood urea because renal failure can occur if there is bilateral obstruction or unilateral obstruction in a solitary functioning kidney so blood investigations are also required uh, and you can also in recurrent stone formers especially you see substances like calcium i mean calcium levels uric acid levels of the blood uh, so to pinpoint the cause to diseases plain x-ray abdomen is a simple investigation many of the radiopaque stones will be seen in this uh, but ct scan 
is much more reliable in identifying these stones than Penex Red Demon. But of course, it is simple, cheap, and easily available everywhere. So plain X-ray abdomen can be taken. Plain X-ray abdomen has also got role in following up these patients. Multiple stones are there after treatment again. The first X-ray can be compared with the later X-rays and then follow up these patients. Of course, ultrasound abdomen is the, uh, the most popular investigation for identifying the stones in the urinary tract. Most of the upper uh, urinary tract stones, that is in the pelvic, pelvis and uh, upper two-thirds of the ureter, uh, you can find uh, these stones very, very easily by the ultrasound because uh, they form shadows because they are impervious to the sound waves and they form shadows and then you can identify them and if there is any obstruction to the urinary uh, tract and hydronephrosis that also you can assess at the same time but uh, lower uh, you I mean part of the ureter uh, uterovesical junction is not very very clear sometimes it may not be possible especially if there is a overlying gas bowel gas sometimes some difficulty will be there for ultrasound but otherwise ultrasound is a primary choice of investigation for any any person coming with ureteric colic intravenous urogram used to be the standard uh, investigating modality in the past it still has got a lot of importance ivu not only shows uh, uh, some of these stones as negative shadows but also gives us the functioning of the urinary uh, uh, I mean kidneys kidney function also it will give us idea also you can delineate the anatomy of the urinary upper urinary tract more clearly by this intravenous urogram as I was telling you CT and uh, contrast and non-contrast CT is a gold standard presently to find out the stones in the urinary tract so these are all the investigative modalities by which we diagnose urinary stones. I'll show you some of the cases where the stones are there. You see this is a plain x-ray KUB. KUB is kidney ureter bladder x-ray. This is typical KUB x-ray, plain x-ray, not contrast. So this shows a radiopaque shadow typically at the ureterovesical junction. See this is the iliac spine. You have to identify the iliac spine at the region of iliac spine. So you have a radio in fact two radio big shadows are there. Normally when you read uh, plain X-ray abdomen KUB you have to track the ureter. See the ureter I Previously also I told you travels along the tips of the lumbar, I mean transverse processes of the lumbar vertebrae. These are the lumbar vertebrae. These are the transverse processes. So this is the line it, it takes both sides. See, you can see the transverse process here, transverse process. So the tips of the transverse process vertically the ureter goes along the trips of the transverse process of the lumbar vertebrae. At the pelvic brim, it curves, it curves towards the iliac spine and here is the bladder. So, this is the line of anatomical uh, landmarks of uh, the ureter. So any opacity in this area should be suspicious. Only thing is, uh, sometimes a uh, opacity in the bowel, overlying bowel, uh, or uh, in the right hypochondrium, gallbladder. So these are the areas sometimes that we get confused in the plain X-ray abdomen. That time, if you have any doubt, you have to take a lateral X-ray. Any shadow which falls 
behind the bodies of the vertebrae it will be urological uh, i mean urinary origin anterior to the bodies of the vertebrae in the lateral x-ray they will be non neurological shadows so that's how you identify so this is a typical uh, shadow of a staghorn calculus you see phosphate calculus typical they fill the calyces and form a cast uh, which shows uh, the calculus typical phosphate calculus stroboid calculus staghorn this is an ultrasound you see this is the kidney this is the capsule of the kidney the parenchyma see these are the dilated calyces so normally this in normal kidney you don't see this much big calyces you will have a central central echogenic complex what we call it but in this case there is a hydronephrosis so calyces are dilated this is a containing fluid and there is a stone this is a stone why you call this a stone is there is an after shadow you see stone prevents the rays passing through this sound waves not rays so there is an after shadow so this is a stone obstructing and causing hydronephrosis intravenous urogram on the left side uh, is normal system you see calyces are normal they are concave tips uh, the ureter also is not seen throughout because there is a peristalsis if ureter is seen throughout that means there is an obstruction and it is dilated also see you can see the thin ureter this side normal ureter and the diameter increased here on the right side even the pelvis is enlarged there is no clubbing as at right now but usually there will be clubbing full fledged clubbing occurs if it is left untreated further you can also see a stone here see it forms a negative shadow because there is a dye in the ureter pelvis and in the bladder there is a dye radio opaque dye is there and here the dye is not there that's why it is radio lucent so this is the stone which is obstructing the ureter uh, vesicle junction stone obstructing on this side and causing hydronephrosis so this is intravenous urogram clearly delineates the anatomy of the urinary tract and the functioning of the kidney both the kid sides kidneys are functioning because it is excreting the dye that means they are functioning how do you manage these cases <coughs> most of the stones especially the so small which are small will automatically gets expelled you don't require any uh treatment except pain relief and ureteric colic is there so spontaneous expulsion occurs in most of the for most of the calculi intervention will be required in a small percentage of the stones due to various reasons which i'll tell you so conservative management is instituted whenever you find uh, a stone which is less than 5 Uh, millimeters in largest diameter if it's less than 5 mm is half centimeter usually most of this they will be passing through and then patient will uh, uh, bring the stone that uh, tell that he passed it even sometimes rarely even 1 cm stones also we have seen patient passing so but 0.5 cm is the diameter more than 90 95% of stones will be spontaneously will be passed but while passing the stone he may have pain and there may be temporary hydronephrosis also so he requires treatment for pain relief so pain relief is best achieved by nsaids 
you have to give it in parenteral form injection injection diclofenac you can administer uh, to the patient uh, which uh, gives uh, dramatic relief of this pain even ketorolac also you can use it uh, sometimes when the pain is not getting relieved because of the magnitude of obstruction is much more then you may have to resort to give narcotic analgesics but most of the patients get relieved by ketorolac or diclofenac injection you also have to give antibiotics because there is a dilated system if uh, infection occurs there can be erosepsis which is very very detrimental to the function of the kidneys so you have to give antibiotics and bed rest if there is vomiting you have to give anti-emetics and severe emit I mean vomiting causes dehydration you may have to give IV fluids appropriate IV fluids as required these are all the modalities of management for most of the stones uh, and overwhelming majority of the stones are the small stones. You can try medical expulsive therapy uh, for some patients uh, if the stone size is smaller and not passing because most of the these patients have to be observed and the stone is spontaneously passed. Suppose if uh, the stone is not getting passed uh, uh, spontaneously, you may have to prompt it to pass, I mean, uh, you may have to uh, uh, give a tr treatment for expulsion of the stone medically. One of the modalities uh, we adopt uh, uh, for medical expulsive therapy, if the stone is not passing for more than eight weeks, in spite of your, uh, uh, I mean, increasing the fluid uh, uh, intake. See, fluid intake, uh, excessive fluid intake, of course, uh, uh, dilutes the stone forming constituents of the urine and uh, the stone will not increase in size uh, and uh, it also promotes uh, diuresis and uh, during which some, some of the smaller stones get passed. Apart from that if uh, it is uh, and diet also some dietary uh, low salt and low protein diet if they, they have to take during this time. If even after eight weeks of uh, treatment conservative management if the stone is not getting passed expelled then uh, you can give tamsulosin tamsulosin is a alpha blocker which is which has got uh, dilatory of i mean it dilates the ureter so dilatation of ureter uh, some of the stones which get obstructed there because it is i mean uh, if you uh, the ureter is dilated uh, with tamsulosin uh, administration then it is likely more likely to get passed or expelled from the urinary tract so tamsulosin you give 0.4 milligrams once in a day this also you can give for uh, uh, a month or so so that uh, it facilitates expulsion of the stone so that's a medical intervention and along with that of course the diet and the fluid intake increased fluid intake all these things you have to ensure and suppose if while passing he gets pain you have to give a pain relief also this is the conservative management if the stone is of larger size or even if a smaller stone is not getting expelled because there is a stricture or something in the ureter so most uh, you may have to resort to intervention nowadays we have got uh, excellent uh, armamentarium of uh, in, i mean uh, instruments which will help us with minimal access 
uh, intervention these stones can be removed one is extracorporeal shockwave lithotripsy ESWL extracorporeal shockwave lithotripsy ESWL is a modality where high energy sound waves are uh, focused onto the area of the stone so suppose the stone is in the pelvis or in the ureter the sound waves which are high energy wave sound waves which are generated by the machine are focused onto the stone these high energy shock waves when gets focused onto that stone they disrupt the energy is released and they disrupt the stone and shatter the stone into small small pieces of course depending on the type of stones the effect will be there some stones are easy to break by ESWL some are difficult but uh, you have to try so when they become smaller stones they are easier to handle by the urinary tract see many of these smaller stones can be spontaneously passed or if some stones are rem remaining and not getting passed the size is reduced they can be picked up by other modalities also so extracorporeal shockwave lithotripsy is one of the modalities we use for managing the urinary calculi endoscopic st stone removal so bladder can be uh, as a cystoscopy uh, cystoscope I mean uh, cystoscope can be passed on to the bladder and through the cystoscope again another thin scope ureteroscope can be passed on to the ureter and when it ascends through the ureter these stones can be visualized and when stones uh, that obstructing area is reached a laser probe or a hydraulic probe uh, through a channel to the erythroscope can be passed on to the uh, I mean tip can be placed besides that stone and you can use the laser energy or uh, uh, electro hydraulic energy or sometimes uh, ultrasonic energy uh, these stones can be blasted and then sm small small pieces can be uh, I mean uh, picked up uh, through this I mean, ureteroscope. So that is endoscopic stone removal. There are various modalities which I will graphically describe in the next few slides. So, uh, ureteroscopic stone removal, endoscopic stone removal, all come under this. And then there is a percutaneous nephrolithotomy (PCNL). If the stones are larger than one centimeter. Are not passing, uh, and especially for the staghorn calculus, you may have to resort to percutaneous nephrolithotomy. This is again done by introducing uh, under uh, CM guidance, under uh, image intensifier guidance, you put on a needle into the renal pelvis, pelvic calcial system through that needle you pass a guide wire and through that guide wire you pass on dilators which are uh, progressively bigger in size and then when the track is dilated you pass into the pelvis through the loin incision uh, I mean small under local anesthesia or, or general anesthesia you pass on this by this Seldinger technique, this is the technique which I was just describing is that a Seldinger technique where you first pass a needle, hollow needle through which a probe guide wire and then remove the needle and through the guide wire you pass series of dilators which are bigger enough successively and then pass a sheath 
into the pelvis and this, through the sheath you pass a nephroscope and then visualize the stones and again you can tackle the stones by either electro hydraulic probe shattering it or a high energy laser shattering it or you can use even uh, shock waves or ultrasonic waves to uh, splinter the large calculi into small small bits and then you can either drain through a uh, normal urinary tract by putting a stent or you can just pick them with a forceps through nephroscope and clear them that's the way it is done percutaneous nephrolithotomy there are a lot of complications per percutaneous nephrolithotomy uh, but in general it's very very beneficial than the open surgery uh, bleeding can occur sometimes because if we enter the vessel uh, the track enters the vessel there can be bleeding also so these are all the minimal access intervention methods uh, by which you tackle the renal stones but if these are failing in spite of uh, attempting these the stones are not getting clear then you may have to do open surgery so before that i <coughs> some of the pictures of uh, this is the percutaneous nephrolithotomy pcnl see there is a stone here on the right pelvis so this stone has to be removed so there is an axis here a sheath is passed into the renal pelvis through the loin and through this sheath a balloon is deployed to occlude the pelvic ureteric junction so that whatever this is a stone negative shadow because there is a dye here the opacity is there and then there is a negative shadow this is the stone region so when you blast this stone the splinters that we want to pick up through loin incision that's why a balloon is kept occluded here then you send a probe and blast this or pick up the small pieces through the nephroscope this is how it is done the pelvis nephrolithotomy sometimes uh, ureteroscopic removal see through ureteroscopy you pass on a dormia basket so this is the dormia basket probe it passes proximal to the stone and where the the basket is open and when you pull it it entangles the stone gets entangled in the in the dormia basket and through i mean uh, cystoscope you can remove that this is one way of doing it or through the nephroscope I mean the ureteroscope you can pass a probe ultrasonic probe and a high energy probe and which can shatter the stone and the pieces can be uh, drained spontaneously or with a stent uh, they can be expelled so these are the ways what are the surgical options open surgical options the standard uh, operating um, uh, surgery is uh, pelvilithotomy so uh, through a loin incision you approach the pelvis of the kidney and the kidneys pelvis is isolated and uh, an incision is given over the uh, region where the stone is there and then it can be picked up see this is how it is done this is the pelvic calculus so surgically open surgical method way incision you approach it and then you give a longitudinal incision and pick it up and then close it other one is extended pyelothotomy sometimes the stone gets entangled into the minor calyx uh, 
and deep into the substance of the kidney. So, normal pyelolithotomy may not be, I mean, possible to remove the whole of the stone, especially uh, big staghorn calculus. You may have to do extended pyelolithotomy. Uh, extended pyelolithotomy is done by incising the parenchyma of the kidney. See, kidney is highly vascular. If you incise it, the torrential bleeding can occur. This extended pyelolithotomy can be done by uh, securing the renal vessels. So you have to loop the renal vessels and then uh, cool the kidney and occlude the blood supply and approach it through Brodel's line. Brodel's line is a, a convex line on the convex border of the kidney on the posterior aspect. This is where the junction between the anterior and posterior vessels. So, in between the supply of the anterior and posterior vessels of the renal vessels, uh, you have a, uh, a line which you call Brodel's line which is on the convex border of the kidney on posterior aspect. So you approach to there so that the blood can be, bleeding can be minimum and uh, bisect the kidney into two like this and then all the stones can be picked up by open surgical method. But again you have to suture all these things uh, in a tight way so that hemostasis can be secured. This is extended pyrolithotomy. The next is nephrolithotomy. <coughs> uh, again, uh, this is again uh, done under uh, cooling the kidney, securing the vessels. Nephrolithotomy, external pyrolithotomy has to be done. Uh, these are the procedures. And uh, ureteral lithotomy is another procedure. So the ureter can be approached by a groin incision depending on the location of the stone the incision actual incision is given a groin or loin and the ureter is uh, slinged uh, distally and proximally so that the stone uh, will not uh, move and an incision is given over the vertical incision again is given on the ureter and the stone can be picked up and later this ureter can be repaired with a stent in place. So this is these are all the ways of uh, managing the ureter uh, the urinary calculi. Nowadays open surgical methods are less often resorted to because we have excellent uh, technology uh, which will facilitate us tackle these stones with minimal access. So that finishes our today's uh, class. I hope my audio uh, e and then uh, the transmission is proper. Okay. Bye.